Okay. So what were the key unsettled or unanswered questions at the time that you performed your experiments? The key unsettled questions at the time I did this <clears throat> have to do with the pathway that, that proteins for secretion went through the cell. Uh, the current, uh, the prevalent idea at the time was that the proteins were synthesized someplace in the cell, probably the rough ER, though it wasn't 100% uh, known. The idea then was that the proteins would diffuse out of the ER into the cytoplasm, would diffuse back into the secretory granule, and then diffuse back out. In other words, it was soluble transport without going through another, a second membrane, except the plasma membrane. But you can imagine, if you know what a membrane is all about, getting a hydrophilic protein through a hydrophobic membrane without consideration of channels or transporters was really very strange or very difficult to anticipate. On the other hand, there was this organelle in the cell that everybody assumed had nothing to do with secretion called the Golgi complex. I had the idea that possibly the Golgi had something to do with secretion, and that was based upon a number of observations that other people had made, <clears throat> primarily that when cells secrete very actively, the Golgi gets bigger. But then again, it wasn't clear, there was no evidence to indicate that. And in point of fact, my mentor, George Pilotti, actually had published a paper with Albert Claude, <clears throat> very strongly indicating that the Golgi was an artifact of fixation. And you can imagine where that landed up in terms of his CV later on. I have a copy of the original CV, but poor George, he didn't know at the time. Um, so what was the scientific environment at the Rockefeller when you were working in his lab? So when I was working in his lab, there were two or three people <coughs> there who actually were inventing or discovering what cell biology was all about. There were two major thrusts. One had to do with cell fractionation, and that was a man done by a man called Philip Siekiewicz, who was a pure biochemist, and actually was involved in cell fractionation, as was Albert Claude. The other group was the group of Keith Porter. Keith Porter was a fantastic electron microscopist. He actually discovered and named the endoplasmic reticulum based upon the first observation using an electron microscope of a cell grown on, on a screen for the EM. And actually, it's kind of interesting, Barbara, that that question came up, because at the Rockefeller at that time, there was no electron microscope. U.S. Steel in the Empire State Building had the first electron microscope, RCA scope, and Keith Porter went down there. So Keith was there, there with the students, <coughs> Phil Sikovitz, the biochemist, and George Pilotti, he was a combination of morphologist, biochemist. His background, in contrast to the others, was as an MD. He came from Romania, and he was very keen, although he was, you know, he did practice during the wars over there, but he was very keen on understanding the connection between morphology and function. And he actually, this is kind of an aside, you can wipe it out, but he did a full-scale mock-up of a dolphin's kidney. Don't I, I can tell you why it was a dolphin, but he always wanted to get the structure-function connections. Mm. And so what he did was to try and make a connection, both at the biochemical level as well as at the morphologic level, of uh, what structures and cells did. So when I came along, I was assigned to a different project that didn't work out worth a damn, uh, he went on vacation, and he said, your proposal to use the pancreas in vitro to do pulse chase experiments is doomed to failure. And by he, you mean George. George. Little did I know that my committee actually was going to see how it worked out for me over the six weeks he was out. Otherwise, they were going to dump me. So, it sounds like George was not so excited about the experimental proposal, how did he respond to well, the results when he came back? Well, let me come back to the, the rationale for it. And the rationale for it was that, as you know, the exocrine pancreas produces digestive enzymes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, if you think about a cell 
living in vitro, it's secreting digestive enzymes, it's going to chew the whole thing up. However, little did they know, but I did, at the time that there were protease inhibitors with the proteins secreted into the gut. They have to be activated. So that was unknown. I figured, you know, what the heck, I'll just try it. Uh, so it, this is using tissue culture slices. You know, I had to develop all these techniques, even the EM auto radi radiography. So when he came back, I had basically done it. I had done the EM auto radiography, which is quite pretty. I think Barbara showed you that. <clears throat> I had done the cell fractionation, whereby elements of the Golgi and of the Raffiar, albeit not 100%, pure indicated very clearly that with time the proteins remain within the membrane bounded compartment, move sequentially through the cell from the rough ER to the Golgi into the secretory granules which then underwent membrane fusion and exocytosis and never were they exposed to, they were always remained within the membrane bounded compartment. So that was our mantra. So I showed in this and I still have the notebooks over there Barbara, you can look at them with the data. So he came back. George was a very formal fellow. Very, He spoke multiple languages, including Latin. And But I showed him this. And his response was, Jesus Christ! <laughs> and at the time, I smoked, and he wanted a cigarette. He'd never, ever done that before. He was, you know, Jesus Christ! So anyway, we immediately had a paper in the PNAS on that, and uh, that was sort of the beginning of the beginning of a lot of different relationships with him. So speaking of the relationship, yeah. so he came to Yale and started the cell biology department at Yale, Correct. and and he brought you along. How did your mentorship relationship change after you got to Yale? Well, actually, it's kind of interesting. He was a very formal guy, even at the Rockefeller, and there were some pretty famous people there at the time. Uh, one man was David Sabatini, and you probably have heard about his studies on transport across the ER, and Gunter Blobel, who was a postdoc, an absolute maniac at blowing up centrifuges, but he got the Nobel Prize for the 661 transport Porter from the you know bound ribosomes into the rough ER. Everyone called him Dr. Pilati. And I remember we had been there for a long time. David and I were you know, sort of at the MD types who came there uh, to get a PhD. He's still around, David, this is NYU. But one July 4th, <coughs> he, George, we think with Dr. Pilati, presented to us with a little card. And it said, as of July the 4th, whatever year it was, being on a freedom, what is July the 4th, Independence Day, in the future, you are allowed to call me George. And he signed it, Dr. Pilati. <laughs> I think I still have that thing someplace. <clears throat> so thereafter, he, he, you know, he, he was serious. It wasn't really a lot of joking around. And he was very, very much involved in analyzing the data. You know, if you're doing electron microscopy, you have to know everything about the process. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you're stuck looking at artifacts. So he insisted we had to remove the tissues from the animals. In my case, it was the guinea pig pancreas. We had to fix them, do the fractionation, take the electron micrographs, know how to use the, the electron microscope, print our own photographs in the darkroom. No technical help was allowed. And... Uh, so it was from, you know, from the very granular training. Right now, you take a sample to the EM service here. They produce a picture, and I've seen a lot of those pictures. It's pure garbage. In other words, you have to know what you're doing, technically, in order to properly interpret things. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. No, so no, you're, you're good at telling us, um, in terms of knowing what to do, a little bit change of topic, but... Many students in our class are interested in becoming an MD-PhD. As the longest standing MD-PhD program director in the U.S. at 30 plus years at this point, um, what advice can you offer them? Uh, <laughs> it's a very, very interesting question. 
I, I think the main piece of advice would be that if you're interested in doing research and combining it with medicine, you have to get a solid background in medicine. You have to know what the patient's problems are because they will be driving, believe it or not, they will be driving any aspect of research you do. So the context of the patient and the training as a medical, you know, during the, during the MD training are key to actually doing good science. The, the other thing, too, and I recall back to when I was a, an MD, <clears throat> just beginning, like some of you students here do, to take a fifth year in, in medical school, I think it was the first one in the world to do that, anyway, in, at the University of British Columbia. And my mentor's wife said to me, whatever you do in life, do it with a passion, number one, and when it stops being fun, stop doing it, do something else. So I, I think that I can drift on and on here, but I think making sure this is something you really want to do, do rotations before you decide. It's a long, tough life and never stops. But I think the fact is that you really have to be totally committed, otherwise you'll be frustrated. Thank you for your time.